WISC-TV now presents For the Record. The hurricane devastation in Puerto Rico is being felt here in Madison. We will tell you how and why next on For the Record. Thanks for joining us. I'm Neil Heinen. Nearly seven weeks after Hurricane Maria ripped through the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico on the heels of Hurricane Irma, more than half the island remains without power and water is hard to find. Humanitarian response from the United States to one of its own territories has been widely criticized, and we will talk about that during this show. But suffice to say, just hours before we gathered to record this program, it was announced that FEMA would transport at least 3,000 survivors to the U.S. mainland seven weeks after the storm. The impact on Puerto Rico's 3.5 million people has been difficult to imagine or describe. That impact has also been felt by Puerto Ricans throughout the United States, including Madison's significant Puerto Rican community. Joining me to talk about that impact are Madison attorney, attorney Mario Mendoza, a shareholder with the law firm Murphy Desmond, and Veronica Figueroa Valles, director, executive director of UNIDOS. And thank you both very much for joining me. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. So where do we start, Mario? I, you know, I think maybe with um, explaining the relationship between Puerto Rico and, and I want to start with Madison, but I think what's been exposed throughout all of this is a pretty, a pretty um, a, a disturbing lack of, of knowledge about the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. I see it as, actually as an opportunity. Oh. You know, from this uh, hurricane and its aftermath, we now have an opportunity for those of us who've been living in this community, in my case, almost 30 years, uh, for folks to know that, yes, there are Puerto Ricans uh, here uh, in Madison and throughout the state of Wisconsin. I think a little bit of history, I think, is uh, helpful. Uh, at the conclusion of the Spanish-American War, 1898, uh, the Puerto Rico became a possession uh, of the United States. In 1917, by an act of Congress, Puerto Ricans were granted citizenship. Let's pause on that for a second. Imagine that, less than 20 years after a war with a foreign power, the, the U.S. granted citizenship to the former subjects of that foreign power. I don't know that we will see that again in our lifetime, right. but a remarkable time. Sure, it coincided with the American involvement in World War I, but nevertheless, it is a significant uh, development in, in public policy and then brings uh, Puerto Ricans in some ways into the fold of the American uh, civic culture. The rights of uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico uh, are limited. Puerto Ricans living in Puerto Rico cannot vote for the U.S. president. Uh, they do not have a voting representative uh, in Congress. They do pay many of the uh, taxes, uh, payroll taxes, uh, Medicare, uh, Social Security, but not the income tax. They serve in the military and have done so with distinction since uh, World War I and every other conflict uh, since then. Now, the uh, the, the, the relationship becomes complicated uh, on, term, on economic terms, which are important to understand what was happening in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria hit in the heels of Hurricane Irma, which had just hit uh, a few weeks uh, earlier. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico is not permitted by uh, a, a law of 1920 uh, from receiving uh, ships from foreign countries uh, into their ports. What, what does that mean? That means that the goods that are transported into Puerto Rico actually have to be uh, under an American U.S. flagged ship. What does that mean? That means that many uh, shipments will go to, say, Florida, unload, load onto a U.S. flagged ship, and then shipped over to Puerto Rico. That increases uh, the cost for any sorts of uh, uh, goods going into the island. Right. Um, and the cost of living reflects uh, that the, that increase uh, in the cost of transporting uh, uh, goods. But there are, as you well said, uh, three and a half million American citizens uh, who live uh, in Puerto Rico. What has been the state of the economy, Mario, prior to the, to the storms? Back in, you know, mid to late uh, uh, 20th century, one of the big drivers of the Puerto Rican economy uh, was what's what we call the 936, uh, Section 936 of the uh, Internal Revenue Code. It was a tax credit program that encouraged uh, certain industries, in particular the pharmaceutical industry, 
uh, to locate in Puerto Rico, and they would receive a tax credit equal to the tax liability uh, that uh, would be derived from the activities in, in Puerto Rico. That helped propel the Puerto Rican economy for many years, up until 1995, when the law was repealed. And Puerto Rico, I know there is this sense that Puerto Rico is sort of a third world country. Well, I grew up there. I can tell you it isn't, and I have been to third world countries. Uh, particularly during that period between the 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s, Puerto Rico experienced, uh, you know, compared to other places in Latin America, uh, great economic uh, prosperity. What happened then? In 1995, this particular law uh, was repealed. The uh, tax incentive for pharmaceuticals and other industries to locate in Puerto Rico were eliminated, and of course, those industries left. Then comes the Great Recession, from which Puerto Rico has not recovered. What happens then with the tax base? 2007, 8, we're talking about here. Correct. Right, right, right. Tax base uh, is uh, eroded, uh, and the infrastructure then starts naturally to suffer. Uh, we're talking about you know the uh, generation and transmission of uh, electricity, uh, the water uh, system, because well the government is somewhat cash strapped as a result of the loss. The of infrastructure all that was, has been fragile to begin with. Correct. Um, um. And then the government did get in financial uh, trouble. There is a sizable uh, debt, one that is in some ways managed by a fiscal control board appointed by the president. Uh, president Obama appointed the members of that board, and they are trying to institute austerity measures to try to get uh, the uh, government uh, pocketbook under control. And then two hurricanes hit Puerto Rico. First Hurricane Irma, knocking out power. You know, there's people who have not had power, uh, you know, for at least three to four weeks prior to Hurricane Maria right. uh, hitting, and then Hurricane Maria uh, comes to visit. I want to talk more about the uh, about the hurricane when we come back. But before we go to the break, Veronica, just uh, talk about the work of of Unidos, if you would, and helping and, and how that might help us understand the Puerto Rican community here. So um, UNIDOS is an organization, it's a number of organization that is statewide providing services to the Latino community and the immigrant community in Wisconsin, um, mainly to uh, folks who are undocumented um, and folks who suffer domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. So as a Puerto Rican myself, um, I had the, the thought of using our 501c3 nonprofit status to really focus on Puerto Rico and how we can help both financially and look at long-term solutions that could help the people mm -hmm. of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And with that came a group of over 42 people that didn't even know each other, who are Puerto Ricans too, and a few who are allies, um, to really come together to to bring solutions to the issue of Hurricane um, Irma and Maria and really help the people of Puerto Rico. All right, let's 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 take a break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the Puerto Rican community here in Madison right after this. Okay. We are talking about Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma and the impact on Puerto Rico this morning. And we were talking about it with two uh, Puerto Rican members of the uh, Madison community, Mario Mendoza, who is uh, an attorney and shareholder with Murphy Desmond, and Veronica uh, Figueroa Velez, who is executive director of UNIDOS. And we're talking about the impact of the storm on, on, on residents, on the three and a half million residents of Puerto Rico, U.S. citizen residents, but also on on the community here. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking back of stereotypes now, uh, mm. Veronica, of people who know uh, that there are Puerto Ricans in the United States have been for a long, long time. And whether it's just West Side Story or <laughs> professional baseball, you know, I mean, but th th that, that is part of the, it's part of the, I think the image that a lot of people have. And yet it somehow doesn't um, translate into an understanding of the relationship between Puerto Ricans and the country that they are a part of and the communities uh, in, in which they are. And uh, uh, do you have any idea how big the Puerto Rican community in Madison is? Not in Madison. Yeah. I think last time we checked in Wisconsin, there was about four, about 4,000, 400,000 people uh -huh. that are from Puerto Rico across the state of Wisconsin. It, it, here in Madison, Mario, I mean, is it a, is it a, a homogeneous group or? No, and, and, you know, Puerto Ricans certainly um, are not. You know, we come in all shapes, <laughs> sizes, and races. 
yeah. we are a generally a mixed uh, bunch. Mm -hmm. um, you see, you know, professionals, you know, like uh, Veronica, humbly I'll say my, myself, you know, contributing in, you know, nonprofit, the nonprofit world, uh, law in my case, uh, music also in my case, in the case of uh, many others. We have uh, engineers, uh, uh, members of the faculty at the UW, uh, you know, the contributions are, are far and wide. And then, you know, also, you know, folks that work in the hospitality industry. We, we're everywhere. Uh, you know, we are your employees, we're your neighbors, uh, we're your employers, uh, you know, and, and, and we, our history here in Madison is relatively recent, you know, I think I knew very few Puerto Ricans who lived here when I moved years here, ago? almost uh -huh. 30 years ago, uh -huh. but over time, you know, I would say that we have, for years I used to say, oh, there's about 300 Puerto Ricans, but I said that for too long because then <laughs> the numbers caught up and, and surpassed that. I would say that there's probably close to maybe 2,000 Puerto Ricans in the Dane County area. Mm -hmm. I've been researching to see if, if we mm -hmm. could find those numbers, but it's probably somewhere uh, in that area. And you know, we are involved in government and everything that is uh, part of the civic and economic and cultural life. Uh, here in Dane County. So talk about the conversation then, Veronica, um, within UNIDOS on, on, on helping um, either people in Puerto Rico or people who are coming here from Puerto okay. Rico right now. So we are actually, of course, in communication with other organizations such as Centro Hispano and other places to really try to help people who moved here find resources, whether that is employment, whether that is education, enrolling kids in school, being connected with the university if they want to continue their education that they left off over there. Um, and it's, it's really a group of people working together to achieve this. But then other than that, we created the Puerto Rico Relief Fund of South Central Wisconsin. And our goal is to really look at long-term solutions to continue to support the Puerto Rican people in Puerto Rico. And with that comes a fundraising campaign that we have out there. And our goal is 100,000 we have already served Path half of halfway through um, that goal, and really looking at what are the immediate needs of Puerto Rico to really uh, target that particular immediate need, and also going into communities. There is a member of our group who is traveling in Saturday, on Saturday, and she will be connecting with the contacts that we have in Puerto Rico and the resources that we have gathered out there to really ensure that our funds and our efforts are going straight to the people of Puerto Rico, not to overhead or government or anything like that. So that is really <coughs> invested in people. Um, we're, again, connecting with so many different groups. We are connected with the university. We're connected with organizations in town, business who have done plenty of uh, uh, support in, in financial support as well as events for this fund and also just people like us regular ordinary people that really want to make an impact who have people in their um, family members still in Puerto Rico and what first started as a group of people really worry about their family became a group of people worry about the entire um, community in Puerto Rico. Now that, that certainly stands in contrast to um uh, the the more formal response particularly from the US government and we have certainly all seen expressions of frustration and anger with what has been perceived as a slower than other disaster relief response um, and and even even a bit a bit of political conflict that's involved in this how would you characterize the current situation and how, how, how Puerto Ricans are looking at it I can tell you that the optics first of the response have been awful. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, you know, President Trump, you know, saying that Puerto Ricans went playing into really old um, and discarded, I thought, stereotypes that Puerto Ricans want everything done for them. Not true. Uh, he visits Puerto Rico and decides that it makes sense to throw paper towels uh, at people as if there is something to celebrate. There isn't. Uh, and then, you know, there's the conflict between the uh, mayor of my hometown, San Juan, calling the federal government to task and saying, you need to treat these American citizens as you would American citizens in Florida or Texas or every, anywhere else. We have a president that then also says, well, we can't be there forever. Well, <laughs> we, we American citizens are there forever and the federal government ought to do its part uh, in supporting. And then we have, you know, the acting uh, Homeland Security Secretary saying that some part of this is a good news uh, story. The optics have been terrible. And does that extend to um, 
a frustration with, with the lack of action by Congress and maybe the fact that there's a lack of representation for Puerto Rico. I, I'll say two things about that. Yes, you know, this has brought to the forefront some of these old tensions, and we're talking about you know, nearly a well, hundred years uh, worth of tension uh, and criticism of the current colonial uh, structure. Um, at the same time, though, you know, Puerto Rico does have a non-voting uh, member uh, of Congress, and she has done a phenomenal job of bringing representatives from, uh, from the Senate and, and from Congress mm -hmm. to Puerto Rico to see with their own eyes both the extent of the devastation and the response to it. She's done a phenomenal job. And, and I have to say that, you know, when you um, make those statements, you know, the Puerto Rican people want everything done for them. I think that if the Puerto Rican people did not stand up and support each other and help each other uh, to the extent that they have, we will still be suffering even at a greater level. Mm -hmm. Also, you have to think that <clears throat> because of power, because of communication, and because of the lack of so many other um, infrastructures that allow us to see really what's happening in Puerto Rico, you're not going to be able to see really what's happening in Puerto Rico unless you travel down there. I actually spoke with someone that just came from Puerto Rico and told me, what you see is actually worse, 10 times worse um, than what we're seeing on TV. Let's take the last break here, Veronica, because when we come back, I want, I, want, I want you to talk a little bit about rebuilding efforts and then how people can help with those rebuilding efforts. And we'll do that right after this. I am back with Veronica Figueroa Velez, who is the executive director of Unidos, and Mario Mendoza, who is attorney shareholder with the law firm Murphy Desmond. We are talking about the devastation caused by hurricanes in Puerto Rico. And, um, you know, the, we, we hear about the power outages, we hear about water, we've seen some images, but from people that you've talked to, from people who still have relatives there, or even people who are coming here, how do we really understand the extent of this and how long it's going to take to rebuild? Let me give you some uh, perspective. I have a very good friend. I have many friends and family in Puerto Rico. One friend in particular is a uh, you know, tough as nails woman, unfazed by anything. We were communicating you know, through an app and right in the middle of the hurricane, a woman that I have never seen crack under pressure ever said, this is really scary, and it was. Uh, Puerto Rico has never experienced anything like it, and I would dare to say most communities haven't. So after the hurricane, it is as, some people have described it as if a uh, lawnmower the size of you know, 100 miles by 35 miles, the dimensions of Puerto Rico, came through and wiped out everything. Uh, there are roads that were wiped out. The, uh, obviously, the, the light poles and uh, wires for distribution of electricity, you know, knocked down. Um, the uh, com communications uh, infrastructure uh, decimated. Uh, many of us, I can tell you the story, I, I heard ultimately from all of my relatives, some of them in about a, the week or two weeks uh, after the hurricane hit. One relative in particular, my grandfather, I didn't hear from him or had any news from him for three weeks. I didn't know if he was dead or alive. That gives you some idea of how you know, devastating uh, this hurricane uh, was. Uh, there are stories of uh, people who became isolated because roads leading into their communities were washed away or bridges uh, collapsed. Uh, and you know, what do you do when you don't have water when you don't have uh, a, a greater supply of uh, food, uh, and people started going, American citizens in a territory of the United States were going hungry and dying uh, from malnourishment, lack of water, or disease. Boy, it's, so, <clears throat> it's tough to reconcile with the, with the instinct, I think, to minimize it. I th and I think, in, in, you know, in, in the face of, of New Orleans and Texas and things that have happened on the mainland, there just seems to be this, this desire to make it seem not as bad or equivalent to what, what has happened here. Well, the, the president hasn't held that perception I, I by understand. saying, well, Katrina, that was a real disaster. Yep. Well, I have news for you. This is a real disaster. And sure, perhaps to some, it is an epiphany, a great discovery, to learn that Puerto Rico 
is an island in the middle of the ocean surrounded by water. Well, yes, it is. But we have heard from uh, various uh, uh, experts, uh, including some in the military, that say there is a different way, a more expedient way, uh, of handling uh, this recovery uh, effort. But for whatever reasons, that is not happening. I mean, there is absolutely no reason why in 49 days you haven't sent the military there and all the aircrafts that you have possibly to actually get to the mountains of Puerto Rico. There's absolutely no excuse for that. I mentioned the, I mentioned the FEMA relief effort when we yes. started the show and, and what part of that is there are, we're, we're hearing reports of, of, of citizens of Puerto Rico who, who don't want to be airlifted to the mainland. They want to help rebuild their, their homes, their I mean, island. And so, Veronica, what's the best way that people can help do that? I think that the best way is to really find and trust your organizations that you can donate funds to. Financial support is greatly needed right now. Um, the other thing that it, the lack of water to drink, you know, drinkable water is an essential thing. Water is life. So we need to work on that water supply and ensure that people have clean water to drink. Um, Otherwise, and that's both getting clean water to the island, but rebuilding the rebuilding infrastructure that there. Rebuilding infrastructure yeah. that yeah. provides that clean water to people. The Puerto Rico Relief Fund is actually negotiating right now on efforts to send filters down to the island um, in a few weeks to communities that need it the most. I mean, we're working with people like, you know, in the town of Utuado who lost a whole bridge, and you cannot get to those towns to deliver goods other than putting a rope from one end to the, to the other to just send baskets will take forever to do that. So there's people in Puerto Rico they have not been reached been able to get rich too because there's no no bridge we continue to have uh, rain so there's floods everywhere um, so right now it's you know the Puerto Rico Relief Fund like I said um, here of Southern Wisconsin is collecting funds and can people and call you need us if they yes, have questions absolutely Veronica and, and Mario thank you very much for helping us understand this I appreciate you taking the time thanks for having us we're gonna wrap up for the record right after this Contact Unidos with any questions about how you can help the disaster relief in Puerto Rico, and thanks for joining us.